Hi students, welcome back to geology. This week we are talking about volcanoes, plutons, and igneous rocks. So in this first lecture, we're gonna discuss volcanoes. All right, so looking at the anatomy of a volcano, there are a couple of terms here that we're gonna focus on with plutons more so, and those are sill and lacolith. But in general, we have some sort of steep-sided mountain that is being created from lava erupting out of the crust. And so this all stems from a magma chamber, a magma body, which is molten rock below the crust, trying to force its way through the crust and erupt out into the atmosphere. And so when it's when the material is inside the earth, we call it magma. When it's outside the earth, we call it lava. Okay, so those two different terms. If it solidifies underground, it's going to solidify in what we call pluton, and we'll talk about that in the next lecture. If it comes out of the crust and erupts on the surface and it solidifies there, we call that a volcano. Um, so depending on where the material is solidifying, we're going to get two different types of what we call igneous rocks. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture. All right, so looking at some basics, so we already talked about lavas on the surface, magma is below, both of those form an igneous rock. Um, we can look at those rocks and get an idea of what the magma or the lava chemistry was of the particular volcano or pluton. And so that composition is controlled a lot by the viscosity and the viscosity is controlled by the composition. And so if you don't know what viscosity is, viscosity is the ease of flow of a material. So in this case, we're talking about lava. And so this is controlled primarily by silica, but also by the gas in the lava. So the more gas, the more silica, the stickier the material becomes the harder it is for it to flow. So lava that flows really far from the vent is going to end up being very low in viscosity and low in silica, low in gases. So volcanoes are particularly a problem when we have a large population near them. Um, and this is the case with a lot of volcanoes on Earth. Um, there are large populations are in, on Hawaii. There's also Indonesia <clears throat> and then those upper right two are photographs of Naples, Italy, around Mount Vesuvius. And we all know that Mount Vesuvius had a has a tragic past, and the city of Pompeii and its ruins are proof of just how devastating volcanoes can be. Um, but in general, the reason that people congregated around volcanoes originally was because they had very fertile soil. So the material that is eroded off of the volcanic rock ends up being very fertile, and it helps grow crops. So this would be a great place to congregate and start you know, working on your community. And that is what happened. The problem now is that if these volcanoes erupt, they devastate those areas. Um, so we need to know as much as we can about volcanoes in order to save as many lives as we can. All right, so Around the Pacific plate, it is interacting with a lot of other plates and subducting and sliding past in a number of different places. And this creates a lot of volcanism. And so we've talked about this already a little bit, but this is the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is basically a rim of volcanoes around the Pacific plate where it's interacting with other plates. So we have pretty, um, particular spot on earth where a lot of the action is happening. Um, so you'll hear a lot of the same places that we talked about with faults and earthquakes. We'll also talk about with volcanoes. All right, so we have three basic types of volcanoes. We have shield volcanoes, we have composite strata volcanoes, and we have calderas. And so shield volcanoes are our most passive eruptions. They just kind of spew out material um, the viscosity here is really low, so stuff just kind of oozes out and flows really far away from the caldera or the vent. Okay, and then with composite strata volcanoes, those are your iconic volcano shape. They have those steep sided angles on their hills and they erupt fairly explosive eruptions and they do have a little bit more um, higher silica content. And then calderas are our catastrophic catastrophic eruptions. Um, and those erupt only every 100,000 years or so. 
We don't see a ton of those eruptions. In fact, nobody has ever in modern times actually witnessed one occurring. So when that does happen, that would be very interesting to see. Um, Crater Lake right there is an example for you for the caldera. The Cascades are all composite stratovolcanoes. So those start with Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta in California and go all the way up through Oregon, Washington, and Canada. And then shield volcanoes, we have lots of them on Earth, but Hawaiian volcanoes are a good example. All right, so starting with shield volcanoes, shield volcanoes are very broad, gentle shaped, sloped volcanoes. And the reason for that is because their lava is a very low silicon, very low viscosity. It just kind of oozes out and runs far from the vent. So imagine dumping ketchup on the table. It's just gonna ooze away from the point in which you dumped it, right? Versus something like mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, if you dump it on the table or the counter, it's just going to blah in one spot, right? It's not gonna flow very well. And so if it doesn't flow, then you're not going to see a broad, gentle slope. So we do know with measurements as well that there's low silica here, low viscosity. Um, so we end up with very passive eruptions. The rock type that is erupted out of these volcanoes is basalt. And the Hawaiian Islands, like I said, are a good example. So if we look at the Hawaiian Islands, um, these shield volcanoes are pretty intense. Um, they do spit out a lot of lava. For example, um, Mauna Loa is the largest volcano on Earth just by volume alone. Um, so the amount of material that has actually come out of that volcano is just massive. Um, and then Mauna Kea, which is to the north there, is actually the largest structure on Earth. I know Mount Everest is always known to me, the tallest mountain, and it is the tallest mountain from sea level. But if you take Mauna Kea from its base, which is the ocean floor, where material first started coming up to the surface, it is actually taller than Mount Everest. So massive, massive amounts of um, lava coming out of this volcano, of uh, these volcanoes, this is a series of volcanoes. And right now the active, um, the main active one is Kilauea, uh, but Mauna Loa has made some noise recently. So here are some of Kilauea's um, eruptions. We have 1999, 2002, and 2018. And these all kind of show the different variations of lava that can come out in different eruptions. So for example, in 1990, 1990, it actually shows you what happens when this lava hits vegetation. So fires can break out, right? That can be a huge issue. In 2002, it shows you lava entering the ocean. What happens when lava enters the ocean? Well, it gets really smooth and cools really quickly. Okay, and then in 2018, that shows you a very rough lava that's very slow progressing on this street. Um, and it kind of crusts on the edge. So it gives you kind of a different texture than what you would see in like the 1990 photograph. And I'll talk about those lava types in just a second. All right, so in 2021 and 2022, we saw some big upticks in eruption on Kilauea. And um, this shows you the gas emissions over time. So you can see that there was an uptick in October of 2021. Um, and it stayed kind of elevated until it dropped back down. Um, but the eruptions kind of continued. So we do use... Um, upticks in gas emissions. In this case, this is sulfur dioxide as an indicator of volcanic eruptions. So we think something is going to erupt or something is actively erupting. Um, and that shows you daytime and nighttime what the lava lake inside the volcano looks like. Looking at some heat flow and eruptions. Um, so the top photo shows you the heat flow and you can see the red area is the hot area. So all of that is where the eruption was occurring. Um, and then the bottom shows you uh, the actual eruption extent and how hot everything was. Um, so you can kind of see that there was some heat, but that real red in the center there, that is where the hottest point was, where material was coming out. And so on the USGS website, which I have linked here, which will be in the PowerPoint um, notes, you can see a live webcam of what the volcano was doing. 
um, and I took this real time um, from the website. I don't know if they have this one saved somewhere, but I made sure to save it um, because it was pretty cool. So even September last year, it was still doing quite a bit. Um, as you can see, um, nobody's in danger here, but it's a really good spot to do some real in-depth volcanology to study this volcano and find out more about how it erupts and why it erupts the way that it is. All right, so we talked about the Hawaiian lava a little bit. I, I mentioned that when lava enters the ocean, which you can see in this little video here, it cools really, really quickly and it creates a real nice smooth texture. And that smooth texture they call here pahoehoe, -hoi, which means rope-like. So if it doesn't enter the ocean necessarily, it can still exhibit this pattern. You can see the upper left picture showing you that. Um, as it solidifies, it kind of creates this rope texture to it, and they call that pahoehoe. -hoi. Now that rough texture that I showed you where it was coming down the street in that 2018 Kilauea eruption, that one we call aa, -ah, and that just means rough. And so it's kind of got this crust on it, and it's a rougher texture of the basalt. Both of these are basalt, and just a slight variation in chemistry and the atmospheric conditions can change the way the lava is presenting itself. All right, looking at some of the volcanic hazards on a shield volcano, we have gas emissions and lava flows are the two highest. So we're looking at sulfur dioxide and some carbon dioxide emissions, and then obviously lava flows. Lava doesn't care where your house is or where your cars are, or where we built roads. It's just going to run right over it. So these are some hazards to look out for with shield volcanoes. Moving on to composite strato volcanoes, these are our iconic volcano shaped mountains that we see. And here there are a lot of different things coming into play. We generally see a very high or higher silica and higher viscosity compared to shield volcanoes. But between the three, this is our intermediate volcano. Um, we do see very explosive eruptions out of these volcanoes. I'll show you some eruptions off of different composite strata volcanoes in a second. And the material that is erupted out of this is what we call andesite. And when we get to igneous rocks, it'll make more sense what these names mean, but just table them for now. All right, so here's an eruption on Mount Etna in Italy in 2013. And I like this because this photograph really shows some of the potential hazards here. So some hazards are really obvious to people that ash fall things of that nature. But what's not so obvious sometimes is that the snow, which is the white part in that right hand photo, um, is actually susceptible to melting, right? Because lava is hot, snow is cold. What happens when snow melts? It turns into water and it rushes down that mountain very quickly. Um, and that leads us into something we call a lahar. And so a lahar is basically a mud flow that is rushing down the mountain and the lahar picks up all kinds of different things um, along the way branches rocks debris sometimes a little bit of ash lots of stuff coming down one of those stream channels in a very quick fashion and so that is one of the hazards that we see on these volcanoes another one is a pyroclastic flow which is a really quick um, flow down the mountain of ash and a little bit of lava sometimes. We also have the lava flow that can happen, landslides that can happen. We have the ash fall coming down. And then sometimes there are ejectiles being projected out or yeeted out of the volcano. Um, and so these pockets of lava are flying through the air and they are creating this shell around them and we call them lava domes. So here's a look at some of those hazards. Um, some of them are obvious and some of them are kind of a result of. So we talked about the lahars, which is a bunch of material coming down in water. And when that gets to low areas, it floods the areas. So that bottom left shows you some flooding. The middle picture shows you some of the um, lahar coming down. Ash falls, obviously a huge issue. So bottom right and upper left show you some ash. The upper left is ash in microscopic view, and you do not want 
to be ingesting that. So you'll want to wear a mask if you are in an area that has experience of volcanic eruption or currently is. Um, masks will definitely help you not eliminate, but prevent nearly as much ash going into your lungs. And then pyroclastic flow, which is that upper right-hand photo, is a very hot plume of ash and of molten rock that is coming down the mountain around 100 miles an hour and at temperatures reaching 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is extremely hot. Um, you are not surviving a pyroclastic flow even if you get within 10 feet of it and you're not actually in it. You're probably not surviving. Um, I did actually just watch a documentary on the volcano in Australia, New Zealand, uh, down under, and um, it there were people on the island when it erupted, and now people can't go visit the island anymore. Um, but there was a couple of people that actually survived the pyroclastic flow by jumping in the water and hiding behind um, larger pieces of rock, um, which I thought was really interesting. They did still obviously burn really bad, but... Um, up until that point, I didn't think it was actually possible to survive the pyroclastic flow at all. So, um, interesting documentary. I will recommend it on Canvas. All right, so in 1980, we had a massive eruption off of Mount St. Helens, which is one of the Cascadian volcanoes. And in April of 1980, they started to notice this bulge. So if you look at the bottom left, you can see that there's a pretty big bump on that volcano, and that's not normal. That's a pretty big indication that something's going to happen and it's not going to go well. Um, and then by May, it actually erupted. So these photos show you the progression of um, the volcanic eruption, and eventually we saw a very large lateral blast out of this volcano. Okay, so take a look at this eruption video, which is just a series of those photos put together. Um, and let me know if you can determine what the trigger was. So what was the trigger on this volcano? I'll give you a minute to answer the question. All right, so in March of 1980, they suspected that magma started intruding and by April, they saw the bulge. And then in May is when the actual eruption was. So it was pretty quick. Um, I know that does, that's, that's a month, but um, in geologic time, that's really fast. Um, so in May, what ended up happening is there was so much pressure on the side of the volcano from that bulge that a landslide took place and that landslide removed a bunch of material, removed a bunch of pressure that was basically holding the magma in place and allowed the release of pressure to just erupt all of the material. And so it started with a lateral blast and then a full vertical blast. So the aftermath of that was a lot of trees falling down. So that top photo there shows you um, a bunch of very large trees that were over 100 feet tall that were actually flattened and all of that blast just completely it looks like it mowed them down essentially um and then <clears throat> that bottom photograph shows you the extent of some of the lava it's a little cut off but um, it's fairly extensive from the vent and we got a lot of our information um from this guy named david johnston um, he was present during the blast, and he was killed by the lateral blast. So the observatory that faces the volcano now was named after him. So it's the Johnston Road Observatory. Um, but he was, if you're going to go out in a blaze of glory, that's the way to do it as a geologist, I suppose. Um, but he sat and monitored the volcano for months um, as this all unfolded. And it's just crazy what a difference a day can make when a volcanic eruption occurs. But there is a lot of monitoring now on this volcano. There's things like spiders. Um, we have this new scanning equipment. The more technology comes out, um, the more we can learn about these volcanoes and keep an eye on them. We can monitor the temperatures. We can monitor the geochemistry. All of those things are vital in understanding how these things work and if they're going to erupt again and when. 
Right now, the most dangerous Cascadian volcano is Mount Lanier, and this is in Washington. Um, this one is dangerous because it hasn't erupted in a very long time. We haven't seen it on the same recurrence cycle as the other Cascadian volcanoes. And all of its drainage points lead down to Tacoma, Washington, uh, which is the capital of Washington state. All right, moving on to calderas. All right, so calderas are our largest features or our largest volcanoes, and they have catastrophic eruptions. We're talking not just the immediate area being affected. Um, they form when magma below is released and the entire thing collapse where there once was magma. Um, sometimes this can look like a stratovolcano that collapsed on itself. Other times this is just an area where magma was pushing up on the surface. The rock that has erupted is rhyolite. We have high silica, high viscosity, which leads to the catastrophic eruption. It's a real massive eruption. Um, it's uh, Long Valley Caldera, Crater Lake, and Yellowstone are all examples of these. This is Crater Lake, if you were wondering. So here's kind of a look at it. We have magma pushing up on the crust. And then as material is evacuated, eventually we have a full collapse where that magma once was. And so it creates kind of this bowl, just like you saw in the Crater Lake photo. It's a big bowl and now it fills in with water. All right, so with calderas, we start with the crater lake size, which is still very massive. And it goes all the way up to what we call super volcanoes, which is what Yellowstone is. So Yellowstone is this really large hot spot of material that is forcing its way to the surface. There's a huge volume of gas and silica and molten rock that is just pushing its way to the surface and finding any avenue that it can to basically release. Um, like I said, these only happen, the eruption will only occur about 100,000 years or so. So every 100,000 years we see one on Earth. Um, but it can erupt up to 2,500 cubic kilometers of ash in one eruption, which is gigantic. It's a lot of ash. Okay, so when we compare Yellowstone along Valley, so we talk about Yellowstone a lot because Yellowstone is the big, bad wolf, so to speak. But... California also has its own caldera, which is Long Valley. It is a lot smaller, as you can tell from these um, maps. <laughs> uh, Yellowstone takes up most of the state of Wyoming, and um, Long Valley caldera is only a portion of Owens Valley on the east side of our Sierra Nevada. But there's, they can still both create a lot of asphalt, so we need to be careful um, when we're learning about them. Um, this was a really interesting article that I found in a magazine that showed a, an amazing image of the plume below Yellowstone. And so this is the plume that is mapped below using seismic waves. So remember seismic waves show you different materials below the surface. And so they've used seismic waves to kind of reconstruct what they think the plume looks like. And as you can see on the surface there at the top, I mean, that's the little state of Wyoming and that's the massive plume that's below. That's kind of scary. When these calderas erupt, they release a lot of ashfall and this shows you the extent of some of that ashfall in certain eruptions throughout time. So Long Valley Caldera erupted 760,000 years ago and that shows you the extent of it. Um, it also has Mount St. Helens on here for you. You can kind of take a look at just how extensive these ash falls can be. This also shows you something about volume of magma released. So we have Yellowstone, a couple of Yellowstone on here. We have Long Valley. Um, we do have Lassen, which erupted in 1915 in California. Um, Mount St. Helens is on there. And then Toba, if you're wondering, is a caldera in Indonesia. Um, so pretty big eruptions, lots of material being erupted here. And as I said before, in the West, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of volcanoes. These are all the Cascadian volcanoes. They're all a result of the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate below North America. Um, and so you can take a look at this map and look at all the different, there's different uh, plate boundaries there and there's different volcanoes on this map. All right, so just a brief summary. We have three basic types of volcanoes. We have shield, composite, shadow, and calderas. 
Shield have low viscosity, composite strato have intermediate, and calderas have high viscosity. Um, the volcanoes that erupt, uh, the, the lava that's erupted onto the surface is an igneous rock, which we call a volcanic rock, and they cool at the surface. And so we'll talk about volcanic rocks in the igneous rocks lecture. Um, but up next, you're going to watch Plutons. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.